Today we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives, from our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Welcome to Bill Myers Inspires. My idea for this show was to invite guests and get the conversation started, to take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. And we encourage our listeners to look within themselves to take decisive action to make a positive difference. Welcome to Bill Myers Inspires. I'm your host, Bill Myers. And today we are going to be talking about In God We Trust, Racism and the Church with Dr. John Dorhauer. This show explores racism, which is enmeshed in the church and how deep and instantiated the centering of whiteness is in the formation of and the evolution of the church. We will take a look at the ways racism manifests itself, how it alters our perceptions and what it means for those of us who are in the church, but also are advocates for racial equality and justice. My guest today, the Reverend Dr. John C. Dorhauer, author and theologian, currently serves as the ninth general minister and president of the United Church of Christ. John began his ministry serving First Congregational United Church of Christ and Zion United Church of Christ in rural Missouri. Missouri. Did you hear that? Outstate Missouri, if you're in the urban center, it's Missouri. Okay. (laughs) He then served as associate conference minister in the Missouri (laughs) Mid-South Conference (laughs) and then conference minister of the Southwest Conference of the UCC prior to his election as general minister and president. Dorhauer received a BA in philosophy from Cardinal Glennon College in 83 and has a Master of Divinity degree from Eden Theological Seminary and and that same year. Um, so, John, welcome to the show today, and uh, I'm Thank so you. thrilled to have you. Yeah. It's always good to be here, Bill. Yeah, and so I'm excited about this conversation. As you know, we've, we've spent you know, this, the good portion of, of my time doing Bill Myers Inspires focused on social justice and racism in America. And, you know, we've, we've done a show together a, a couple of times, racism yeah. and faith leaders and so on. But this one is, is pretty intriguing because you, you, I, I actually asked you, what, what would we like to talk about? You know, what is sort of burning in your soul to speak about at this time? And for you to talk about uh, racism and the church, uh, I thought, well, n- there's nothing more fitting at this time than to have that conversation. So again, well, I welcome you, and I'm very interested in hearing initially w- what, it, what it was or what it is within you that seems to be a burning desire that this is the topic to discuss today. So, you know, many of us, are, our passion is dismantling racism and its root white privilege, white power, white supremacy. And one tends to think of the church as a, a an ally in that anti-racist vision that we have. But the church has to come to terms with the fact that racism comes out of the church. Um, and that the roots of the church's commitment to racism and the centering of whiteness is deep. And uh, I hope we get a chance to talk about how deep that goes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my spiritual father, the Reverend Dr. Sam Mann, who taught me quite a bit, uses an analogy of a, a rotten sweet potato pie as a metaphor for the church. And the reason that metaphor is important is when you recognize that the pie is rotten, that baked into it um, is something that makes it inedible, then you don't ask, what do you add to it to make it palatable? You throw it out and you bake another pie. Mm -hmm. And what the white church has to realize is the work that they want to do reforming the church is not 
a wise investment of our time and resources. It, it may be that what we're asked to do is just start another church, another way of being church that doesn't have the rotten core of racism baked into it. Mm. Yeah, I, and and I I've heard you make that that uh, that 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 metaphor used that before, and and I you know I I share that belief in the fact that that also could be applied to the United States Constitution, yep. <laughs> in the very same manner. Uh, because I do Absolutely. not believe that the fixes over time have proven themselves to have any lasting power. Um, that constitution is somewhat Teflon. And so all the things that we've thrown at it and tried to band-aid it, right. we're suffering it again as we speak. I mean, voting rights, so on and so, you know, just the racism and er everything is, is wide out in the open. So uh, Yeah, and when when you look at the challenge that our our federal government is having just doing away with the filibuster. Mm. It, it makes the point you're making that those who are invested in the current system may allow you to tweak it, but no substantive changes. And if the filibuster is this hard to change, then the rotten core that is the racism cooked into the pie of America is going to be impossible to undo. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, so let's, let's look at this and, and figure out how do we begin this conversation? I mean, you, you just sort of set yes. an overview, but I, I think contextually in order for our listeners to be able to follow how, how we want to map this out, you know, we've got, we've got three segments here. So, yeah. um, so I think we've laid the groundwork. So I'm, I'm going to leave it up to you to paint this picture because. Um, All right. Well, I'm going to go back in time. Uh, the, the first place I want to go, we're going to go back 2,000 to 2,500 years, okay. and then we're going to back up about 450 to 500 years. And I want us to begin to see the roots of this, and that what happened, not just in America, but my focus, with the church in America was not an accident of history. It was well-intended from the start, and these roots of racism run very, very deep. If we go back 2,000, 2,500 years, and I'm, I'm really dependent here on a work by uh, Robert Williams. Uh, he is a Native American, teaches history and law at the University of Arizona, and he's written a book called Savage Anxieties. And what he's going to do is identify the trope of the Black man as wild beast slash savage all the way back to the roots of Greek mythology, out of which European culture really emerged. And in the mythology of the Greek civilization, and that term civilization is really important here in establishing this principle and the creation of that trophy, in that Greek civilization, there was the Greek world and the walls that bound it. And beyond those walls, the walls of civilization were the, the, the savage beasts, the uncultured populations. And while they might be recognized in the order of human, they were never recognized in the order of civilized world. And the, the work of the noblemen, the civilized gentleman was to tame the savage beast, driven by sexual passions and desires, uh, able to hunt and accumulate food, but not educable, right? Mm -hmm. And what the, the, the civilized world, when the heroes were able to wander out beyond the walls to protect the civilized, were able to do the, the noble work was to tame the savage beast, this wild creature that, while human, was, again, not civilized and not educable. And, and that trophy, the, the whole myths that developed out of that were instantiated in Western culture and, and were, you know, populated from one generation to the next. So much so that by the time we landed on these shores, the paradigm that we functioned with was that these cultures that we encountered fit into this trope of the savage wild beast. 
It's what we encountered when we landed here. It's what we encountered when we landed in Africa. This paradigm of civilization meeting wild tribe was what we functioned with. And we believed not only was it possible for them to be tamed, it was our God-given responsibility to tame them. Mm. And so the enslaved peoples that we brought with us from Africa were viewed through the white lens as savage beasts and we could tame them and with the gospel you know we could sit we could we could uh, make them less uh captured by their wild urges right Mm -hmm. we saw these again as sexualized beings we saw them as tools of labor and whatever we could do to tame them we knew they could never acquire the level of civilized nation that we represented and and it was noble work in fact we referred to them as noble beasts or noble savages and that understanding of the world in which we lived as a white centered european culture never left us and so in this book savage anxieties that's what robert williams talks about and he makes the case that western civilization never left this paradigm Mm. Wow. That that's strong. I'm I'm writing down this the title of this book right away because it's yes. something I want to take a look it, it's at. It's an important work. Yes. It really is. Yes. So 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 we 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 come back from from I mean as as far back as Greek mythology and 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 this this idea this this category of you know savage beasts that applies to everybody but us right <laughs> yes everybody but us um is is it is it found in the idea that we don't uh, is is it so shallow that when we just meet a stranger that is our natural processing or is where does the skin yeah. color and these aspects uh these separators uh come into to play so let's talk about a, a white child growing up in St. Louis, as I did with a racist white father. Here's how it shows up. When we drove down the streets of North St. Louis, and all of a sudden the skin color of the neighborhood and the families that populated them changed, my dad would reach behind himself, lock the doors of our car. He didn't say anything, but what was he communicating? That outside the walls of this safe enclave that I have in, inside this car, are the savage beasts that can't be tamed. And you are no longer safe, but I'm going to protect you. That was the message being sent. And he didn't have to say anything, but I would grow up believing that these families in this part of the city, now that we've crossed outside the the walls of the civilized suburbs where we live, Mm -hmm. that that because of that, the, the land was no longer safe, right? That's one of the ways that it would manifest itself. And I guarantee you, Darren Wilson, the white cop who shot Michael Brown on the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, grew up feeling the same thing. Remember what he said when he stopped that car on the Canfield Green in Ferguson, he felt threatened. Why did he feel threatened? Because on the other side of the the safety of his neighborhood, there lurked these savage beasts. And all Michael Brown had to do was show up black. And he was presumed a threat and dangerous because he was an untamed, savage, wild beast. This is how it continues to manifest itself, this trophy, this paradigm Mm -hmm. in white America today. Wow. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, it's um, it's very interesting to to know and to 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 dive into it and understand that this this way of processing this way of understanding this this way of seeing the world was not some construct of a uh, hundred years ago or something that this is very much ingrained this is a way uh, this is a worldview this is the worldview I mean depending on you know what I mean <laughs> it's in, it's incredible John and, I am um, when when we come back from the break we'll we'll fast forward to uh, the year 1492, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and what happened when the uh, 
Europeans landed on these shores and what they brought with them. Yeah. And we'll see even with that how deep this is. Wow. Well, this is a fascinating conversation, and I'm so glad to to share this time with you, my friend. And um, again, you always make it w- worthwhile. You always bring you you bring it, and uh, and I always learn so much. And I'm I'm grateful to you for that and for sharing that with our audience today. We are ready for a break at this point, and you are listening to Bill Myers Inspires. I'm your host, Bill Myers, and you're listening to the Inspired Choices Network, and I'm here today with my guest, John Dorhauer, as we talk about In God We Trust, Racism, and the Church. We'll be right back in just a moment. Today, we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives, from our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Tune in every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Bill Myers Inspires as he and his guests take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. Emmy Award winning actor Bill Myers is an accomplished actor, jazz musician, filmmaker, writer, educator, and speaker. As a biracial man who's both black and white, Bill leverages his background, talent, and voice through creativity, compassion, and connection as activism for social justice to focus on uniting the divide and compelling change. Bill Myers Inspires encourages listeners to look within themselves and take decisive action to make a positive difference. For more information, visit his website, BillMyersInspires.com, and sign in for the latest news and updates. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspired Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspired Choices Network radio host. Email becomeahost at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. You're listening to... Bill Myers Inspires, here on the Inspired Choices Network. We're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining us. And now, let's get back to the conversation. We are back. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires. And today we are discussing In God We Trust, Racism and the Church with my guest, Dr. John Dorhauer. So, John, you're going to take us uh, up into the future. (laughs) Back to the future. (laughs) Back to the future. (laughs) So go ahead. uh, Yeah, I, I want to talk about what happened when, if I can quote, Native American activist Sharon Harjo, um, the wanderings of a lost Italian lurched onto these shores back in 1492. Many of the explorers, um, not only all of them were funded by some powerful empire in Europe, right? But many of those empires also worked out a a, an arrangement with the church. So they weren't just representing when they landed the kings and queens across the landscape of Europe. Many of them also came with the imprimatur of the church. And when they did, they carried with them a document called the Requeriamento. It's not a document that many people are familiar with, but it is incredibly important. Um, the Requeriamento not only brought with it the authority of the church, it it brought with them with it the funding of the church and the theological background 
for what they were then required. That's what the requirimento is, is the requirement, what they were required to do on behalf of the church. And behind this document was the notion that the entire world belonged to the Pope. All lands were rightfully claimed by the Pope and the church. And with this document, various kings and queens who had made agreements with the Pope would fund these trips around the world and send their explorers out and not only claim the land on behalf of their kingdom with the church, but all of the wealth that it would accrue and accumulate because of that. The, that theological notion that these lands belonged to the Pope, to the church, who was the emissary of Christ himself, that was the thinking behind this, led to this. And, and this is the language, and I'm going to read this directly from the document. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, it's going to shock us. On the other hand, everything that we know about racism in this country will lead us not to at all be surprised by this. But we were taught this as children, and so it does sort of shock our sensitivities. So after having landed, the explorer would open up this document called the Requeriamento and been, begin reciting it. Now, if it's a first encounter with the people, they don't know your language and you don't know their language. Right. But the consequences to this, which we'll get to, are severe. And so the capability of that indigenous tribe to understand immediately what's being communicated to them is, I mean, this is very urgent because literally their life is at stake. The document begins by talking about who we are, where we come, on whose behalf we come, what we're going to do. This land is ours, and here are your choices. And they would even write in the document, we've done this in other places, and the people were friendly and understood immediately what were we, at, we were asking of them, adopted the Christian faith, and became a land of peace to us all. That begins. And, and then we get to this. Therefore, we ask and require, require, that's the requirimento, that you consider what we've said to you, and that you take the time that shall be necessary all those we'll get to in a minute. You better do it quick. Take the time that shall be necessary to understand and deliberate upon it. And then you acknowledge the church as the ruler and superior of the whole world and the high priest called the Pope and in his name, the king and queen of our land as superiors and lords and kings of these lands. That's the claim. If you do so, you will do well. And that which you are obliged to do to their highnesses, and we in their name shall receive you in all love and charity, and shall leave you, your wives, and your children, and your lands free without servitude. But, and here's the but, if you don't do this, and maliciously make delay in it, in other words, you better hurry up. I certify to you that, with the help of God, Note that, and this is the connection I'm making to the church. This is the church landing on these shores with its premeditated pre understanding of how the civilized world encounters the savage world. With the help of God, we shall powerfully enter into your land, make war against you in all ways and manners that we can and shall sub subject you to the yoke and obedience of the church, we will take you, we will take your wives, we will take your children, and make slaves of them, and thus such shall, shall, shall sell and dispose of them as their highness, the Pope, may command. And we'll take your goods, and we shall do to you all of the mischief and damage that we can, as to vassals who do not obey. This is the document carried by the conquerors on behalf of the church. This is how the church entered these lands. And it has never altered its understanding of its place in history and its role on behalf of God. And it still believes that its responsibility is to encounter the savage in others and tame it for the sake of God. And the consequences for not receiving what the church is offering are as dire as they describe them here. 
that's how the church entered these shores. And this is the church we're talking about populating today. Wow. Wow. <laughs> John, that's, it's amazing. <clears throat> and it, it does, <clears throat> it does ring as consistent. Uh, you know what I mean? As, as far as how, how we see things today and, and, and uh, to know that that was always the groundwork and that that was something that was being, I don't even want to say promoted. I mean, uh, by the church, it's beyond promotion. That's a, that's a, that's a bully if I've ever heard. <laughs> heard of I mean, you know that that type of over-the-top behavior um and and i'm just i just struggle with the idea of christ-like is it being absent from every bit of that type of narrative every bit of it I, I remember reading vincent harding before he died was a historian and theologian taught at Iliff seminary in denver and he wrote a a a, a series of history books called there is a river and they document the untold stories of the enslaved peoples of africa's resistance what they would do to resist which are never told to us mm. in in the history books but in the in the introduction to the book i remember him saying that the first understanding that these enslaved peoples from africa had of this church was that one of the slave ships that they were held in was called the Corpus Christi, the body of Christ. Yeah. What's Christian about that? Yeah. And what is the church communicating, not only about its power, but about what it wants to do with its power when it lands upon these shores and sees the inhabitants not only as other, but as inhuman and uncivilized mm. and 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 immediately opt to subject them to you know the the terrorism i mean <laughs> there's no better word for it than terrorism that's exactly what it is wow yeah you've got i'm 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 without words and much of this as I'm be, as I'm processing, I was looking at my notes from my producer who says speechless over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> much the same space, much the same space. So, you know, I, general minister, president of the United church of Christ, we are a white centered denomination. I, you, you can't be the church in America, black, white, brown, red, without emerging out of this centering of whiteness. And um, we're, we just hired a firm that does this professionally, right? To take a look at how we continue to center whiteness. Where is it written into our documents? Um, how does it manifest itself in our hiring practices? Um, where does it show up in how we relate to one another and conduct meetings with one another and, and run our HR department? I mean, they're going to do a thorough, what we call a thorough race audit. Um, and we want to know. What are the remnants and the vestiges of this way of entering this world as church that are still manifest in us today, even given our commitments to anti-racism? Um, and, and I think that's an important engagement for any of us who want to understand not only what are the roots of this, but how does it continue to manifest itself and how we see each other today and how we treat each other today? Yeah. Yeah, that's hugely important. And, and I, I'll share a story with you briefly. There's a, there is a, uh, when I was in high school, there was, you know, uh, it was uh, you know, certainly a racial divide within the school <laughs> itself. Uh, and it actually is even more evident today when I look at the alumni groups that populate Facebook. Yes. And there's the black ones and the white one. And somehow it's, it's like, even the, the folks that did not realize that there, there was a divide <laughs> In the school, I, you know, I was just pointing out to a friend of mine, I said, you know, even if you just go on Facebook now, it's like, this is exclusively the sort of the black kids experience of, of the high school, which is now closed. So this is all we have as far as community it, are these little populations on Facebook. And, but, you know, uh, um, but there was a, there was a country club uh, here in Indianapolis and um 
you know, it was okay to hang out with your, your, your white friends and, and that sort of thing. But when the summertime came, the main hangout place that they, all their families for many generations would, would go to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm walking down the hall and I walk up to a group of, you know, white kids that we're, we're buddies or whatever. And they just sort of become silent. Mm. And, and, and there's this real strange awkwardness because they're planning some major, you know, blowout at this country club that, in 1982, three, four, still were openly known to not allow right. black membership. You're not welcome. And, and it just became, that's the way you handle it is we just get silent about it. And we, shh, we don't talk around people of color. You wouldn't even yep. mention it. So very recently, and I know we're, we're up for a break, but I want to finish this point. Uh, I had, um, uh, a, a, a white classmate reached out to me who was appalled by this whole thing, uh, started sharing a story with me and, and said that there was a, um, there was an incident that, that occurred years ago, um, where a young black kid drowned to death because he, he could not go and swim in the pool there, but right alongside the country club was, was actually a, a river. And so he was swimming alongside his compatriots and unfortunately he drowned and uh, you know so the uh the country club had recently hired uh to address this racism thing hired a, a, a general manager that was a black general manager and i'd met with him several times and attempted to go in to to work with them on this very significant history and and that he may not be familiar with and certainly some of the folks that were there in that institution that it was just had problems i mean it's it it's got scars yeah. and bad narratives all throughout the community so the answer was well hire a black guy you know hit it so i i, I went in and i just asked a, a number of people prior to actually doing the work just posed like about five questions very loose but but probative regarding racism and the responses i got back were well I, well we just look forward to tomorrow we don't we don't honor there was no acknowledgement whatsoever as if you can just sh shake it loose and say well yeah that was then but this is now like there's no reckoning of the thing uh i just anyway i, I wound up walking away from the whole thing because i thought they were okay. they asked for help but yet <laughs> They're not willing to do the work. And it, it concerns me when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, these sorts of things, because um, I think that what I'm starting to see are, are organizations and posturings that are talking about all these things that even get into performance base and other other issues altogether, ignoring the herds of elephants in the room, which was the whole purpose of this. These 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 systems or you know diversity inclusion to address the racism but we want to talk about everything but the racism and use this language i, I don't know I, I just needed to share that because I, i'm not sure so i'm i'm happy to hear of the audit taking place and the 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 boldness of saying this is what we're going after guys and and not losing focus into the sort of slick talk that makes everybody comfortable um it's all very uncomfortable i mean it is so is uncomfortable i mean you know but uh but i know unless we are willing to take a hard look at ourselves there is absolutely no chance no chance that's right for us to get there i'm going to take that break right now you are listening to bill myers inspires today's topic is in god we trust racism in the church with my good friend dr john dorhauer we'll be back in just a moment Today, we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives, from our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Tune in every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Bill Myers Inspires as he and his guests take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. Emmy Award-winning actor Bill Myers is an accomplished actor, jazz musician, filmmaker, writer, educator, and speaker. As a biracial man who's both black and white, Bill leverages his background, talent, and voice through creativity, compassion, and connection as activism for social justice 
to focus on uniting the divide and compelling change. Bill Myers Inspires encourages listeners to look within themselves and take decisive action to make a positive difference. For more information, visit his website, BillMyersInspires.com, and sign in for the latest news and updates. How wonderful would it be to carry your favorite Inspired Choices Network host with you throughout your day? Well, now you can. Inspired Choices Network now has its very own mobile app. Our free app offers live streaming shows, along with thousands of podcasts and TV episodes. Our shows cover a wide variety of topics. Whether you're waking up with us, carrying us through the day, and taking us to bed with you, we're always here for you to enjoy. We're easy to find. Just search for Inspired Choices Network in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires here on the Inspired Choices Network. We're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining us. And now, let's get back to the conversation. We are back. Today we're discussing In God We Trust, Racism in the Church with Dr. John Dorhauer. So, John, take us from this place. Where where does our journey go next? Well, I'm going to do this uh, because of the story that you just told, and maybe we'll get back to the the, the church today, we've talked about where we, the, the roots 2,500 years ago, 500 years ago, but you just told a story about a, a, a white country club that hired a black general manager in order to um, overcome its commitment to a racist past, but didn't want to confront that, right? Mm-hmm. And the key to understanding white investment in anti-racism work uh, I, it's hard to say this is true of everybody, but true generally, mm-hmm. is whites engage in this work to the extent that it has the potential to assuage their guilt about it. Once that is satisfied, they're done. And so for for those who sort of do this work in a shallow kind of way, like the one you described, Uh, A a largely white institution still dedicated to the centering of its whiteness will hire a black general manager, and that's enough to assuage their guilt, and that's all they were ever interested in. And having done that, they can pat themselves on the back and convince themselves, if not others, they're not racist anymore. And that's all they want from it. They're not really looking to make their organization anti-racist. It would take much more than that. And the, the problem with not telling these stories and ignoring our past is this is how we got to where we are. And this is the, these are the stories that tell us who we are. And if we can't confront that, there will be no change and there will never be healing. And that's the other part. This isn't ultimately about um, how whites deal with their guilt and their shame. This really is about healing a wound that whites have in, inflicted upon uh for thousands of years now, the peoples whom they encounter around the globe. And there's no healing for those who are wounded and can't tell their story. When the stories get buried, the wounds continue to fester. And and so there's no healing. And, And if the church is an agent of healing and wholeness, it can't be the one suppressing these stories. It it can't. And yet it is. Yeah. Wow. You know, it and, uh, and and one other piece I, I just want to add before we get away from there uh, is there is a certain point, um, even when uh, oftentimes when when blacks are tapped for these positions and whatever, there there also is a, another reality, which is there they are they they kind of fall in line with the same line of thinking that we don't want to discuss this because again, it's like, it's uncomfortable. So they are sort of in the, the company man, you know what I mean? Yes. I, I, I don't use uncle Tom's things. Like I, I, I think, I don't think there's a need for insult, 
to to in order to make the case but but they could be the 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 fiercest defenders of that let's not go there uh you know what i mean and you go really uh so anyway uh i just find it very odd you know yeah when when you have to navigate the troubled waters of a racist world where whites still are in power um then when the oppressor throws you a bone or gives you something that you can improve your lot in life with, you have to navigate that in a way that you don't offend the one who's given you the gift, right? right. And I understand that. And that's part of the oppression as well. Um, and Matthew Fox, a Catholic theologian, always said, that the work of the oppressor is never complete until the oppressors become the defenders. The oppressed become the defenders of the oppressor. That's when the work of the oppressor is complete. When the only one telling the story from the point of view of the oppressor is the oppressor, their work isn't finished until the oppressed repeat the story and defend the oppressor. Mm. Then there's still work to do. And, and you see this in ways that you just described. You also see it with women who are abused, who will talk about the role of women in the church or in, in the household, right? Mm -hmm. And talk about the need to be subservient to the man of the house. And until women do that, the, the work of men oppressing women is not complete. And the same is true in what you describe. Oh, wow. It's incredible. Incredible. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, until you you root out the, you go to the source and and go as deep as you can to 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 grab it. Um, yeah, you you cannot heal from that. You cannot heal. Right. I'm I'm always fascinated, John. I just want to say this by the idea of 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 the oppressed and the oppressor and the oppressed and the great trauma that occurs uh, mm -hmm. often to the oppressed. But I I I believe that there's there's a there's an even greater trauma that exists when the oppressed finally discover and realize that they have been continued to participate because i think that that uh that becomes a, a twilight zone moment where it's like oh my i actually see my my involvement in this thing it wasn't in the past and and Oh my goodness. You know what I mean? When I think that reality, and I think it's important that we're able to manage, navigate, uh, promote uh, with compassion and the healing part for those, because they are perhaps greater victims <laughs> than the, op the target of the oppression because they've been duped so badly th that their sense of reality yes. has been distorted all along. You, yeah. you, does that make sense? Of course it does. And, you know, there, there's no easy, painless pathway to the, the peace that we're talking about, mm. right? To the, the, the equity that we're talking about. If, what we're, if the roots of this go back as far as we've identified here, then, it, and like a body and, and somebody who's experiencing physical pain, you try to cover it up. You, you do things that allow the body to be deceived into thinking that once the pain is gone, that the wound is healed or that the disease has done its worst and is over. And, and all they do is mask what's there. And when you stop medicating it or stop um, treating the symptoms rather than the source, the pain immediately returns and is often worse. And that's what you're describing here. Mm. And in the only way through this is to face that head on and believe that on the other side of that deep pain is a new way of living that is life giving to all. Yeah. And healthier for all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and it really does bring us back to the central question about, you know, where's your faith? <laughs> if, you, if you don't believe that this is possible, then where where yes. are you, you know? Right. 
Hmm. And when we talk about, you know, like the sweet potato pie, right? Throwing out the rotten pie, throwing out the rotten church. If, if your faith isn't strong enough to believe that something more life-giving is possible on the other side of that, then it's not a faith worth hanging on to. Mm. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, we're going to take another break right now, and uh, we'll be coming out on the into the home stretch, John. So, so I'm going to let you think about how we how we wrap this because I I feel like we're only scratching the surface, of yeah. course, with these conversations. But but the clock is ticking. So, but I do appreciate you being here. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires. Today we're discussing In God We Trust, Racism in the Church with my friend, Dr. John Dorhauer. We'll be back in just a moment. Today we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives. From our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Tune in every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Bill Myers Inspires as he and his guests take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. Emmy Award-winning actor Bill Myers is an accomplished actor, jazz musician, filmmaker, writer, educator, and speaker. As a biracial man who's both black and white, Bill leverages his background, talent, and voice through creativity, compassion, and connection as activism for social justice to focus on uniting the divide and compelling change. Bill Myers Inspires encourages listeners to look within themselves and take decisive action to make a positive difference. For more information, visit his website, BillMyersInspires.com, and sign in for the latest news and updates. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires here on the Inspired Choices Network. We're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining us. And now, let's get back to the conversation. We're back. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires with my guest today, Dr. John Dorhauer. And so, John, here we are in the home stretch. Let's see what you're made of. <laughs> so as we come to the home stretch, I, I want to channel the the spirit of an ancestor we we should learn more about, and that's Howard Thurman. Hmm. Two things about Howard Thurman. One, I want to I want to quote one of his books, but before we get there. I want to talk about what he did um, when out on the West Coast back in the 1950s, he built the church called the Church for All Peoples, because part of what I'm talking about here and part of what I talk about when I do this presentation is the possibility of something new being birthed on the other side of a, a church so inculcated and instantiated with racism that it really needs to start again, not just you know, like a rotten pie, you don't add something to it until it becomes palatable, you start over. And that's what he did. He built the church for all peoples. And he showed us a pathway to what, what the faith could look like when it left behind the roots of white power, white privilege and white supremacy. And taking a look at what he was able to build and create there is a pathway forward. And, and if more of us invested, not in taking predominantly white or predominantly black churches and saying, how do we, you know, how do we diversify them? But actually finding the kind of leaders with the charisma to give birth to something new that from the start has cooked into it the DNA of something beautiful. That's what Howard Thurman did. And then I want to quote, at the end of his book, Deep River, The mm -hmm. Negro Spiritual Sings of Life and Death, in that book, he talks about the power of those Negro spirituals and the resistance that came in the language of those hymns and how singing them became not only an act of resistance against the white authority that was oppressing them, mm -hmm. but a means of enduring the unendurable, right? Of, of giving hope 
in a situation where there was no hope to be found. That's the power of the, the deep river and those Negro spirituals that sang of life and death. And he talked about the phenomenon of the white master forcing the slave to accept his religion. That we see that in the, the requerimento document, right? You will become Christian, like it or not. And if not, we have the power to enslave you. And so the slave foisted its religion on the enslaved. The master foisted his religion on the enslaved. And Howard Thurman writes about that. And because of what the, the in, those enslaved peoples did with that, that their ability to see something authentic in it and bring their African roots to it. He ended that book with this quote, by some vastly superior creative insight, the slave undertook the redemption of a religion the master had profaned. That's what I'm talking about here. That the religion now owned and uh, by the, the, the whites, the, the religion that takes its roots all the way back to that Greek mythology that carried with it onto these shores, the theology of a pope who said, these lands are mine. And if you don't accept that, I have the right to enslave you. Hmm. That church needs to die. And when the slave undertook by force of the master's will, this religion, the enslaved people saw something in it. And what Howard Thurman says is they undertook the redemption of a religion the master had profaned, which is another way of saying to the white church and the leaders of the white church and the practitioners of the white faith, mm -hmm. you're not the ones we're asking to build what's coming, right? Let those who have suffered under your hand undertake the redemption of this religion that you have profaned. That's the work we're talking about here. And I think that's the pathway forward. And that, that may be the hardest thing for white practitioners of a white faith to hear, that nobody's asking them how we get from where we are to where we're going. Mm. That's very powerful, uh, John. And I, I want to add a little something to that uh, amazing um, a friend of mine who they did a documentary of, who is a fabulous jazz musician, piano player, as well as a minister, the Reverend Marvin Chandler. And oddly enough, he was great friends with Howard Thurman. In fact, when he built his church, uh, the Church of All People out in San Francisco, he reached out to Marvin Chandler. And uh -huh. Marvin went out and met with him and, you know, they smoked a pipe and had a moment. And <laughs> Uh, Howard Thurman asked Marvin to be the pastor of that church. And you can imagine the greatness of Howard Thurman and the church that he built asking someone else to be the pastor. And Marvin said, what in the world? You know, why would you want me to be the pastor of this church? And Howard Thurman simply said, I just love to hear you preach. Mm. And so the spirit of, of, of that moment and that, that type of, uh, uh, energy and essence. Uh, I have shared many musical moments with the Reverend Marvin Chandler. That's beautiful. Uh, and um, so very near and dear to me, and he is still in touch with Howard Thurman's um, uh, uh, kids and, and offspring and, and that sort of thing, but he's a, he's a precious soul. So mm. anyway, I just wanted to throw that at you, see. But um, yeah, that's, that's powerful stuff. John, I thank you once again for being here today. Uh, Always a pleasure. And, um, and I thank you all for listening to Bill Myers Inspires today as we discuss In God We Trust Racism in the Church, tackling these very tough topics as always. And uh, again, if we're not talking about them, we're certainly not fixing them. So <laughs> that's the deal. So I thank you so much for being with us today. And I know we're we're running out of time, so I'm going, I'm in blab mode. So, John, any last word you'd like to say? You know, Bill, it, this is, uh, uh, you and I have talked a number of times. I consider it an honor, and uh, I, it means a lot to me that you've asked me back. And so, thank you. And this is hard work. It's meaningful work. It's going to take everything we have, but it's worth everything we have. So, let's do it together. Together it is. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week, everybody, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.
Thank you for spending your afternoon right here with us at Bill Myers Inspires. Remember, we're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Inspired Choices Network. Remember to take time this week to take a breath and look within yourself and figure out how you can make a positive difference in this world. Spread the word, and we'll see you here next Friday. Have a wonderful week.